Rohit, have you started the streaming? Okay, Ria. Yes. Good evening, everyone. So, a uh, warm welcome to the second uh, lecture, international lecture series on language and literature 2020. Now we have with us Dr. Professor Dr. Lisa Hopkins. Lisa Hopkins is a professor of English and head of research degrees at Sheffield Hallam University. She works mainly on Shakespeare, Christopher Marlowe, and John Ford, but has also published on Literature on Screen, Jane Austen, and Bram Stoker. So very warm welcome, madam. And without any delay, you can proceed with your presentation. Thank you so much. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. And very nice to be able to see people on the screen. I have been to India several times. Uh, so I know what it might be like if I were there, and I'm sorry I'm not. I wanted to talk about gardens uh, because the biggest source of new words in Shakespeare's time is actually to do with gardens. Uh, as the influx of new plants comes into England, and although gardens might seem to be places of permanence, gardens in Shakespeare's time are places of innovation and also to a certain extent places of conflict. Um, I must confess, I got the idea for this partly from the fact that my own garden had become a place of conflict. Before there was a lockdown in England, I was the only person who ever went out there and did the gardening. I don't think my husband or my son even knew we had a back door. Uh, sadly, since March, they have both discovered the back door and started interfering in my garden, which is now, as a result, pretty much a battlefield. And that started me thinking about the conflicts of what gets grown. And although gardens might seem a place where nothing moves, nothing changes, in fact, there are places where lots of things move and change. So I wanted to think about that a bit and it was the, the, the kind of the new words which Shakespeare is finding and his audience are finding and the new concepts that they have to contend with as a result of plant hunting and plant innovations. So my quotation obviously comes from A Midsummer Night's Dream where Titania says she will not give up the changeling boy to Oberon because his mother was a votress of my order. And in the spiced Indian air by night, full often hath she gossiped by my side and sat with me on Neptune's yellow sands, marking the embarked traders on the flood. So at the beginning of this, it looks as though uh, Titania it was able to talk to the the mother of the Indian boy, because Titania is a fairy, she can fly, we know that Puck can put a girdle around the earth in a very short time, Titania can visit India and then she can be in a wood outside Athens, why not, what's to stop her? But actually by the end of these five lines we've discovered that Titania is not the only person who can move about in this way, because she and her Indian veterans don't just uh, sit there and look out on the sea by themselves. They look out at the embarked traders on the flood. They look at ships and at the people in the ships who are there specifically because they're not going to India because it's beautiful and interesting. They're going to India because you can get things in India and those things are valuable. And the passage also gives us a clue about what specifically was the purpose of voyages to India, what things people hoped to get from it, they hoped to get spices, the spiced Indian air. So this is a very beautiful and lyrical passage. It's a passage that seems to be out of the world entirely, but it's also a passage that's rooted in the world. And it reminds us of the, the extraordinary new horizons that were opening up to Shakespeare and his audiences. This is being said in a theatre on very close to the Thames. The Thames was the place that you set off from on your big voyages of exploration. If you go now to Shakespeare's Globe, which sadly of course you will find closed, 
but if you if you go to the replica of it when it reopens you'll find just downstream from it a replica of the Golden Hind, the, the ship in which Francis Drake circumnavigated the globe. And I do want to acknowledge, by the way, that I do that the English, when they went off to foreign parts, did not behave well, necessarily. Uh, I have often been ashamed to be English when I've travelled abroad I, and seen things that we did. But one thing I've never been ashamed of is Shakespeare. Uh, because Shakespeare doesn't participate in these things, but he does record them and he brings them to our attention. So in the spiced Indian air, Titania and her boat dress sit there and what they see is the beginnings of a trade empire, which is eventually going to launch, launch the East India Company and lots of other things. And they remind us of the importance of new products to English life because those spices will of course transform English cuisine and other things that come back from foreign parts will transform other aspects of English life. So here's the spice trade route. Uh, you can see that the tip of uh, India is an important place to stop off on it and that's what this is all about. Those, those traders are on that journey a long and perilous journey which begins and ends uh, in the River Thames and would have been familiar to uh, Shakespeare and a member and a number of members of his audience. We, you can pretty much see from uh, various signs in the plays that Shakespeare knows people who've been out there on adventure trips. Uh, there are suggestions in Twelfth Night that he's been talking to merchants who've been to Dubrovnik. He names the elephant, which was in fact the place where uh, traders from Dubrovnik, uh, then called Ragusa, did tend to hang out in London. Uh, there's clear signs in the Tempest that he's been talking to a chap named William Strachey, who had very unusually been to America, uh, and who records what happened uh, when a ship, an English ship, got shipwrecked off the coast of Bermuda. Uh, the Tempest actually quotes pretty much verbatim a bit of Strachey. So Shakespeare knows about this. He is very aware of such voyages and journeyings. As well as spices, imports from foreign places also found a place in English gardens. And we can see this from another of the things Titania says when she wants her fairies to take good care of Bottom, feed him with apricots and dewberries, with purple grapes, green figs, and mulberries. Shakespeare writes these lines around about 1595, we can't be exactly sure when. Had he written 50 years earlier, uh, he might have been able to refer to some of these plants, but not all of them. Had he written a hundred years earlier, he wouldn't have been able to mention any of them. Apricots came into the country early in the 16th century. Uh, Prunus armoniaca, they are called, uh, which gives you the clue that they originate in Armenia. And it's Henry VIII's gardener, who is usually credited with uh, naturalizing apricots and making them grow in Kent, uh, which is one of the milder parts of England. Part of the trouble, of course, with these lovely foreign plants is people buy them, uh, or uh, more likely steal or just dig them up uh, in foreign countries. They bring them back and they stick them down in gardens in England and they promptly die. Uh, apricots are tender, very difficult to get established. Henry VIII's gardener had to work hard, but he did succeed. So Shakespeare mentions them in Richard II, and he mentions them in Midsummer Night's Dream. By that time, they are a thing. They are growing in England. It's a, a new word, it's an exciting word. Shakespeare's grandparents would probably not have known what an apricot was. We are in the quite interesting position of not knowing even now ourselves what a dewberry is. Uh, if you read books on Shakespeare and botany, you will find various ideas about what a dewberry might be. But the only thing that we know for certain is that it's a word that Shakespeare found in a play by Marlowe, Dido, Queen of Carthage. Shakespeare was obsessed with Marlowe, uh, whom I'm sure he recognised as his greatest predecessor. Uh, and I use predecessor advisedly because, of course, Marlowe dies in 1593. Uh, he is stabbed in a mysterious circumstances. Shakespeare, I think, I'm sure would have been affected by that death. He quotes Marlowe all the time. And even when he's not directly quoting him, you can often see when he's got Marlowe in his mind. And in Hamlet, the speech that uh, 
Hamlet remembers with such fondness is almost certainly based on Marlowe's play Dido, Queen of Carthage, which is for my money, one of the greatest non-Shakespearean Renaissance plays, uh, very neglected. It, it's a classic first encounter play because what it shows you is representatives of one civilization meeting representatives of another in a new strange land. It's in a way the ultimate play of empire as Aeneas, the exile from Troy, lands in Carthage and meets the, the queen Dido and dewberries are mentioned as one of the things that is growing, that are growing in Dido's garden. So Shakespeare is nodding as so often at Marlowe and whatever he thought dewberries were, he thought they were things that grew in Africa because Dido, Queen of Carthage is of course set in modern Tunis. Purple grapes, they had been imported to Britain sometime previously at, as, as so many of our current plants, they came with the Romans uh, who succeeded in establishing grapes in the southern part of England. Shakespeare would have known probably of a house called the Vine, which is supposed to be on the site of the first vine ever planted in England and made to succeed. Uh, green figs, well, again, not really native to most parts of England, but imported. And mulberries, and a little bit after Midsummer Night's Dream was written, mulberries were going to become headline news when King James VI decided that he would like to start producing silk in England. And he imported a lot of mulberry trees and tried to establish them. Unfortunately, he picked the wrong kind of mulberry tree. I can't see my notes from where I'm sitting, so I can't remember. But it's either black mulberry trees will make silk and he got white ones, or it's the other way around. Whichever. <coughs> the plans for a silk industry went wrong. Uh, but Shakespeare himself is sometimes said to have planted a mulberry tree in uh, the garden of his house at New Place in Stratford. So there again, there's something new and they're exotic. Mulberries, of course, feature in the original version of the Midsummer Night's Dream story, the version told in Ovid uh, of the Pyramus and Thisbe story, and Mulberry plays a very important part in that. So it's a nod back to the original source. But it's also an invitation to the audience to, to recognize what a vast quantity of fruits and flowers they suddenly have available that they never used to know about before. And the whole point of Midsummer Night's Dream really is whether you can flourish in a place that is not your native clime. So in the beginning, we've got some people who have grown up in Athens, uh, in the ultimate city representing civilization uh, and the pinnacle of human achievement and they suddenly for various reasons they find themselves out in the wood which to Elizabethans would have represented a strange wild and dangerous place. How do they get on there? Can they flourish outside their environment? And although they don't meet the Indian boy, uh, the Indian boy's story represents a kind of parallel. He is, like it says on the tin, he's an Indian boy, he was born in India, Titania has moved him. Uh, how is he getting on? And this question of how people got on in new environments, what I think have been a matter of great urgency in Shakespeare's time, when people are just starting to think about what it means to found colonies, when English people are trying to get a colony going uh, in Jamestown in America, they didn't do terribly well with that. Uh, it's around about now, well, it's not very long before Midsummer Night's Dream was written, but the first colonizers went off to Jamestown to, uh, to try to, well, to Roanoke in the first instance, I should say. Went off to Roanoke, they tried to establish an English colony there. The idea was that some English people would go and check up on them the next year. Unfortunately, the Spanish Armada put paid to that. And when it was finally possible to send uh, an expedition in the search of the Roanoke colony, there was no trace of it. And what happened to those colonists is still a mystery. The only indication was a Maltese cross you go carved to... on a tree uh, and the, the letters Crower, which could have meant anything. People are still puzzling about what that meant. So colonization, moving people from one place to another place. That's the theme of Dido, Queen of Carthage. Aeneas is, if you like, the first colonist. Uh, it is the theme of a, a number of Shakespeare's plays. And with colonization comes encounters with new people, new languages, new ways of thinking, new words. And Shakespeare is absolutely agog 
for those new words and fascinated by those new ways of thinking. And the garden, in the gardens in his plays are one place where that interest plays out. Another play which registers this in a slightly different way is The Winter's Tale. So we, we leap from early in Shakespeare's career to late in his career to uh, one of the, the plays that are called the last plays because again they do what it says on the tin, they are pretty much the last plays that he writes. The Winter's Tale is close to the end of his career. And in that you can find a character who has been sent out to do some shopping. And he has, as many of us might have on these occasions, a list. Three pounds of sugar, five pounds of currants, rice. What will this sister of mine do with rice? I must have saffron to colour the warden pies, mace, dates, none, that's out of my note. Nutmegs, seven, a race or two of ginger, but that I may beg, four pounds of prunes and as many of raisins of the sun. So again, we're supposed to be in Bohemia. Uh, and Shakespeare is a bit confused about Bohemia. He thinks it has a sea coast, but even he would probably have known that the capital of Bohemia was Prague, and this is not the kind of thing that's going to grow well in Prague. I wish luck to anyone who tries to cultivate sugar uh, or currants or have rice fields or even saffron. Uh, I've just been having a, a slight argument with my husband and son. Now they're taking an interest in the garden about whether we can plant saffron crocuses. They have laughed this idea to scorn. They have reminded me that the only place in England that saffron has ever been satisfactorily cultivated is in East Anglia. I haven't told them this. I've sent away from, for some corn from saffron crocuses anyway. They're probably right. I'm probably not going to succeed in growing them in Yorkshire. Uh, you certainly wouldn't grow them in Prague. These are new, they're exotic ingredients. Uh, raisins of the sun, well, that, the, the name gives it away. But the really interesting thing there is rice, because that is so new that the, the speaker, the, the shepherd's son, doesn't even know what she's going to do with it when she's got it. He's not surprised that he's been sent for sugar and currants, fair enough, yes, mace, yes, dates. Well, these clear all things that he recognizes, but rice, huh? What will this sister of mine do with rice? Well, I expect she might make rice pudding, or I expect she might make uh, perhaps some kind of, of other form of boiled rice, but she is absolutely there. She's at the cutting edge, knowing what, uh, knowing even what rice is, wanting it to cook with. These are exotic ingredients. These are a result of, of travel and the new uh, opportunities it brings. And as far as we can see, Rice itself might almost be a new word uh, for the, the clown as he reads this out. He hasn't, he's, or he may recognize the word, but he doesn't really understand what rice is or, and what he might do with it. So you can see the language of Shakespeare's time being colored by new words, new exciting things. Uh, to some people, they offer huge opportunities. Perdita, who's compiled this shopping list, clearly regards these newly available exotic ingredients as a very good thing. The uh, clown, slightly behind the times, is less convinced. She might have some work to do to get him to eat that rice when she's, when she's cooked it. Perdita is also, like uh, the characters of Midsommar Extreme, particularly interested in what grows in gardens. There's a very famous exchange in the Winter's Tale. Perdita is greeting two old men. They are in disguise. She doesn't know who they are. She thinks they're just visitors. She doesn't actually know who she herself is. Uh, I'll come to that in a minute. But she does, she does know that you give flowers to visitors. Uh, but she doesn't have quite the right kind of flowers that she would like to give them. She's got a very limited choice of flowers. And she explains why. So, the year growing ancient, not yet on summer's death, nor on the birth of trembling winter. The fairest flowers of the season are our carnations and streaked gillyvoles, which some call nature's bastards. Of that kind are rustic gardens barren, and I care not to get slips of them. Wherefore, gentle maiden, do you neglect them? For I have heard it said there is an art which in their piedness shares with great creating nature. These are not natural flowers. Had she been able to read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, 
Perdita might perhaps have called these Franken flowers. She regards them as unnatural. And I just want to flip forward a minute and see what it is she is condemning. So this is a contemporary illustration of gillifers. Uh, the, the name of the flower is actually gilly flower. It gets spelled in any amount of different ways. This, because it's in black and white, doesn't give you much of an idea of what the problem is. This modern flower, although not quite gilly flower, does give you a very clear idea of what the problem is. It's bicolored, and Perdita thinks it can only have been produced in that way by artificial means that somebody's been messing with it. So, and I want to go back to the speech and look at what she says. The year is growing ancient. It's not yet. Uh, this, it's not quite summer's death, nor it's the birth of trembling winter. It's probably, actually, therefore, round about now. It could be at September or October time. And when I look out of my window here in Yorkshire, it's extraordinarily sunny for the time of year. Uh, it would be extraordinarily sunny for July, but it's a bit chill. So there's a limited choice of flowers. And the fact that Perdita is aware of uh, the choice of flowers being limited is part of the fact this story is a recapping of the ancient Greek myth of Demeter and Persephone. Perdita is a kind of Persephone. She has been snatched away. She's lived half her life in uh, another place. In the, the Greek myth, the Perdita, uh, Persephone has to spend half her life in the underworld. Perdita was kidnapped as a baby, and she has grown up in a place that not, is not her natural environment. It's another example of people moving. And all she's got in her garden, or rather, she hasn't got it in her garden, what she can see in her neighbor's gardens are carnations and jelly flowers. And she thinks of jelly flowers as nature's bastards. Now, this is pretty interesting because she herself is a child of nature who does not know who her parents are, which is one way of thinking about bastardy. And the reason that Polixenes, the old man to whom she's particularly speaking, the reason he's here is to stop her from marrying his son. Polixenes is the of Bohemia. His son, Florizel, is the prince. There's a lovely flower name for you, Florizel. Uh, Polixenes has been told that Florizel is hanging around a shepherd's daughter, and there's no way that the king of Bohemia wants his son marrying a shepherd's daughter. But Perdita is not actually a shepherd's daughter. She was rescued when she was abandoned as a baby. She was rescued by the shepherd. She's been brought up as if she were his daughter but actually she's the princess of Sicily. She doesn't know that yet, she'll find it out before the end of the play. And in a way, these flowers that she despises are an, almost an emblem of herself. They are odd flowers. They are flowers that don't quite belong in their environment. They are flowers that suggest bastardy to her. And when her foster father picks up the baby that he finds abandoned, the first thing he thinks is that it's a bastard that it's been abandoned there by its parents. He's wrong, but she thinks perhaps that she is herself a bastard. She thinks these flowers are bastards. They are, they speak of her. And she despises the art that she thinks made them. And yet she is herself a, a creature who speaks in a way different from those around her, who thinks in a way different from those around her. She is, Although there has been no art in her upbringing, she, she looks like a creature of art as opposed to the, the nature which is all around her. This is a play which is split into two halves. The first half in a corrupt and unhappy court. The second in a so often in Shakespeare, a kind of green world, a rural Arcadia where you think people are going to be happier. But as often in Arcadia stories, actually you find out there's trouble there too and there's going to be big trouble here in about two then Polixenes unmasks himself and says aha I am the king you are my disobedient son you are a shepherd's daughter uh, I am going to punish the, the, my son and restrain him and I'm going to make your life hell shepherd's daughter uh, there is going to be a happy ending but there's going to be a lot of trouble before that and in the main plot of the play, as you probably know, we've got another version of the Demeter and Persephone story because Perdita's mother has been supposed to be dead since Perdita herself was born. 
and she is going to come miraculously, in scare quotes, miraculously back to life in the same way as the year comes back to life after winter, it, it becomes spring. So here, flowers are extremely important and they're not just about themselves, they're also about people, they relate to people and they tell stories about how people can be changed and how people can be moved and transplanted and literally in the case of flowers, dug up and put in one, from one place to another, uh, and metaphorically in the case of people. Planting being a word often used for colonial enterprises. So we'll go back briefly, we'll look at that striped gillyfly, that bastard, and then we'll think of some more about what Perdita says. She doesn't like the stripy flowers, what flowers does she like? Daffodils. But come before the swallow dares, and take the winds of March with beauty. Violets, dim, but sweeter than the lids of Juno's eyes of Sir or Silveria's breath. Pale primroses, but die unmarried ere they can behold bright Phoebus in his strength, a malady most incident to maids. Bold oxlips and the crown imperial, lilies of all kinds. So this is a bad flower. These are good flowers, daffodils, violets, primroses, uh, oxlips, and the crown imperial. And if I'd been listening to this when it was this play was first put on, I'd have had a bit of a jolt there, I think, because the first four are native English flowers and the crown imperial is most emphatically not. The crown imperial is one of those exciting and extraordinary new imports, a bit like the rice that she wants to cook. It's a big surprise, the crown. Excuse me, ma'am. So, uh, extremely sorry to interrupt you, but uh, can you please increase your volume a little because our uh, viewers are saying that they can't hear you clearly. Right, I'm sorry. I don't know how to do that. Is that, shall I try? I think I'll just try speaking up. Will that help? Uh, that might, but uh, if you have your mic volume, you can try increasing that else. Uh, they're just saying that your sound is not that clear. Right. So, I don't know what controls the sound on this machine, I'm afraid. I wonder... Oh. That's doing something, is it? Yes, I Did that do something? Yes, I think uh, one of our uh, viewers is saying that sound is uh, clear now. So, so please, ma'am. Uh, now, can you sit a little closer to your machine? That is how we can solve the problem. Okay, I'll try that. Yes, ma'am. Right. Our viewers are now giving the feedback that it is fine now. So, ma'am, you can continue. Again, I sincerely apologize for the interruption. No, no, that's fine. Uh, I'm glad to know. Okay, so let's look. Thank you. Let's go back to the flowers. The daffodils, violets, primroses, oxlips, and the crown imperial. So here we have pictures of four native British wildflowers. Uh, daffodil, that's the, well, everyone knows what a daffodil looks like, I, I imagine. Uh, the tall yellow one is oxlips. The purple one, big surprise is violets and the bottom right one is primroses and these are all things that you might regularly and easily see growing anywhere in England in Shakespeare's day. These are plants that Shakespeare's grandparents would have known and recognised and quite possibly grown but not. Oh now then oh right that's just because it's such a big image it's taking a little while to come. The crown imperial which is a kind of fritillary. Uh, and fritillaries had come from the Middle East, from uh, Turkey in particular, and they were a new and extraordinary plant. They are a big surprise. Uh, Shakespeare's grandparents would certainly not have seen anything remotely resembling this, and they would have probably looked at it and thought, what is that? Uh, Shakespeare is very interested in fritillaries. So we know, we, we, we tend to remember that late in the 17th century, there's a sudden craze for tulips, that tulip bulbs are imported from Turkey at vast prices, that people actually bankrupted themselves buying tulips. Don't forget 
But before there were tulips were big news, fritillaries were also pretty interesting. This is a, a strange and exotic plant. It's a plant that I can't succeed in growing in my garden uh, because my garden is not damp enough for it. It does have a relative, a, a slightly less showy, but quite interesting relative, uh, and that is the snake's head fritillary. I can grow that. This is a very interesting plant to Shakespeare because it is the plant that he uh, it brings into Venus and Adonis. And in so doing, he departs from his source and he tells you a classical story with a wildly modern plant in it. Uh, and in, as he does that, he again reminds you of the ways in which the English landscape, even the humblest gardens, were being transformed by exposure to plants from different climes. So the snake's head fritillary is less exotic and ex um, the crown imperial, but it's still pretty interesting. As I say, he mentions that in Venus and Adonis, but he doesn't want to mention that in The Winter's Tale because he wants to point out to you the question of the crown, which is the hidden issue. As Perdita is talking to Polixenes, his problem is that he is the king, her problem is that she doesn't know she is a princess. And we think that this play was performed at the wedding of King James's daughter, Elizabeth, to uh, the Elector Palatine. Uh, we happen to know that uh, for that wedding, she wore a, an imperial crown. An imperial crown is one that has a join at the top, as opposed to one that just uh, sticks up and spikes like a, a Disney crown. Uh, so the crown imperial is a, a kind of important political point to get across. It reminds us again of the ways in which the flowers relate to the people, but it also reminds us of the, the ways in which English gardens were being revolutionised by this sudden availability of new plants. And Perdita, unlike her Shakespeare's grandparents would have had a limited range of things to grow, Perdita has a huge choice of what kinds of things she wants to grow in her garden. And that is beginning to change the way that English people think about their environment. And it's also beginning to condition the way in which they think about transplantation. If you can move a plant from one place to another, maybe you can move a person from one place to another. We know, incidentally, I mentioned the wedding of James's daughter, Elizabeth, and her, her husband, the Elector Palatine. They're sitting in the audience at at least one performance of Winter's Tale. After the wedding, uh, the elector took her back to his home in Heidelberg in Germany, and he planted an English garden for her there so that she would feel at home. Uh, and that involved him thinking through what kinds of plants that grow in England might also be able to grow uh, in that part of Germany. So the snakes had fritillary. I've mentioned the Venus and Adonis connection. Well, how does Shakespeare know about all these things? Well, he knows about them partly through a man called John Gerard, who is his near neighbour in London. And John Gerard is the author of the, uh, the first great English herbal, which is simply called the herbal. Uh, and this is the frontispiece. You can see Gerard holding a flower. There's a lot of from Shakespeare that Shakespeare has been reading Gerard, and I've uh, recently published an article suggesting that he's not only been reading Gerard, he's been talking to him because he seems to know about a plant which is not mentioned in the first edition of the herbal, it's not mentioned until later on, um, but Shakespeare seems to reference that plant and that's a plant called Paris, Herb Paris, I, I think that's behind the name of the county Paris in Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet's got a lot of interest in plants and flowers, uh, Juliet's nurse seems to be called Angelica, which is the name of a flower. Romeo is connected to rosemary, uh, and I think Paris is called after her Paris. So Shakespeare has been talking to Gerard. Uh, he lives close to Gerard in London. Uh, Shakespeare lives in Silver Street for some of his London writing career. Uh, and quite interestingly, uh, at the time when he's living in Silver Street, he is the, the lodger of French Huguenot refugees uh, and his plays at around this time start to have a lot of French in them because presumably his landlord and landlady were able to help him uh, with any French that he didn't know himself. So he's absorbing, he's like a sponge, he's absorbing 
French from his landlord and he's absorbing lang uh, the language of flowers from Gerard round the corner. And these both start to make a big impression on his play. Uh, so we can see the influence of Gerard in a, a number of uh, places. And, and it's not surprising therefore that Shakespeare seems to know quite a lot about flowers, not just the kind of things that he would have learnt from uh, actually having his own garden, but the kind of specialised floral knowledge that is beginning to enter. And one of the things that Gerard and many other botanists at the time observed is how many new words, how many new species there suddenly are out there flooding the English language, transforming it in ways that would have been undreamt of gener in generations before. But there's also another factor which is affecting the way that Shakespeare is thinking about flowers. This is a ruined abbey. Um, Shakespeare seems to glance at the dissolution of the monasteries in the line, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. As well as gardens being transformed, the whole landscape of England was suddenly being transformed by Henry VIII's decision to break with the Pope uh, dissolve the monasteries, turn over monastic buildings to important noblemen, and others of them simply fall into ruin. This extraordinary landscape of ruins, which uh, uh, something else that Shakespeare's grandparents could never have imagined. Uh, Shakespeare had an aunt who was a nun who would have entered the convent in full confidence that she would have spent the whole of her life there. And all of a sudden, that world, that whole world has gone. And with it, went knowledge about flowers and gardens because all monasteries and abbeys had gardens they all had herbalists who tended those gardens and I think it's quite an important factor actually in Shakespeare's representation of gardens that people are no longer quite certain about what plants grow in them what plants are safe what plants are potentially poisonous because with the loss of the monasteries went the loss of garden knowledge. This is something that Gerard observes, something that many other commentators observe. Gardens have suddenly become slightly dangerous places. Uh, and Shakespeare is very interested in poison. I, I mentioned Romeo and Juliet's interested in flowers. It's also, of course, got a very famous poisoning episode uh, that uses a plant-based poison, although certainly aconite. Uh, and there is suddenly a sense that we We've got these gardens, we don't quite know what's growing in them. Some of these plants are new, we don't quite know what growing conditions they like. Some of them are potentially dangerous. They used to be herbalists and now there aren't and anything could be happening out there. So this is a, the scene in which I think Shakespeare most openly reflects on the loss of monastic gardens. This is still from a film of Romeo and Juliet. Here is Friar Lawrence talking to the young Romeo. Friar Lawrence knows all about what's growing in his garden. We see him as his natural environment. But once you take the monk out of the garden or the garden away from the monk, then the possibility of poison creeps in. Uh, and of course, this is a play that will end with poison. There are other plays in which poison uh, is features and is also again connected to gardens, most famously Hamlet. Old Hamlet is poisoned while sleeping in his orchard in the afternoon. Seems a slightly funny thing to do in Denmark, which is not noted for its hot sunny weather, but conducive to siestas, but very appropriate indeed if you want to start talking about the Reformation and you want to start talking about gardens and poison all in one breath, then putting an old king in his orchard and having uh, the poison poured in his ear as a kind of almost a way of symbolizing that the fact that it's socially transmitted, that it's a, a verbal poison as well as an actual poison. I think that's a very interesting way to do it. And of course, Hamlet is totally obsessed with flowers. And when Perdita is giving out flowers to Polixenes and to Leon, uh, to Camillo, she is looking back partly at Ophelia, trying to distribute uh, flowers to uh, to Claudius and, and to the rest of the court, including her brother Laertes. And again, both women, Ophelia and uh, Perdita, talk about the ways in which flowers 
shepherds need to be fitted to persons. And when Ophelia has died and is buried, her brother hopes that from her fair and unpolluted flesh may violets spring, may she become like a flower. And Hamlet thinks of her as Rose of May. Uh, so the language of flowers is very important, uh, something it's always well worth paying attention to. And it's therefore not, I think, surprising that uh, the first few plays that Shakespeare probably was involved with preceding even, even Midsummer Night's Dream are all about the dangers of flowers in one way, because the, the first few plays, the, the, the plays that tell the story of King Henry VI, also tell stories about the war of the, the Wars of the Roses. And, and although the Wars of the Roses was not really fought over roses, roses become its symbol. The Wars of the Roses apparently have their origin when the followers of York and the followers of Lancaster had a quarrel in the gardens of the, the temple in London, uh, gardens which Shakespeare could still have seen, uh, gardens which were being reworked by Francis Bacon a, a little bit uh, before, uh, pretty much actually in the same year as the globe is uh, built. Here you see somebody plucking a white rose, somebody else plucking a red rose, and the white rose became the badge of the House of York, the red rose, the badge of the House of Lancashire. I still, I live in Yorkshire, it's sometimes still known as the white rose county. Uh, Lancashire is the red rose county. The Tudors amalgamated the two in a kind of fantasy, partly red and partly white rose that never could have existed. But Shakespeare knows that gardens are potentially dangerous places. Uh, and in another of the plays that doesn't uh, yet tell the story of the Wars of the Roses, but is the build up to it in Richard II, he again shows us a crucial scene in a garden where the Queen and a gardener discuss the imminent downfall of the king and the loss of the kingdom uh, and they talk about it in terms of apricots and other plants and what kinds of things you must do to gardens to keep them in good order. For Shakespeare the garden is always potentially a microcosm of the kingdom as well as the place where in Christian belief uh, the whole thing began to go wrong for humanity because it was in the garden of Eden that Eve plucked the apple and brought humans to the fore. So a garden, an extraordinarily rich and complicated place. We may think now of gardens as peaceful and if one goes to Stratford-upon-Avon, which is not, very few people are doing at the moment because obviously the theatre, like so many other things, is closed by the pandemic, but one of the things that many people want to do is go and see the Shakespeare gardens. Uh, which are very beautiful and very splendid and have historic links to Shakespeare himself. Uh, they may seem to be an image almost of Englishness, of peace, of beauty, of continuity. And certainly when people go and see the Shakespeare gardens, it seems to be for many of them a way of getting in touch with Shakespeare himself, as if gardens were something that had not changed, as if a garden now could connect us to a garden in Shakespeare's day, but Shakespeare himself would have known that that was not so, that a garden is not a place of peace or stability or necessarily even of tranquility. It could be a place of danger. It's certainly a place of change. It's a place that uh, speaks of new words and it's also a place that speaks of new worlds. Thank you, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for listening. I'm now going to stop screen sharing and I'll be very happy to take questions if I can see or hear them. Okay, thank you very much for such an innovative topic, ma'am. Okay, so we have some questions with us. Uh, the first question that uh, I want to ask you is from Anita Sharma. She has asked, where would you place Shakespeare's plays on the context of theory of eco-criticism? Ah, well, there's been a great deal of work done on this very recently. Uh, and this is a kind of bit of a change in itself because when I was young, nobody would ever have heard of eco-criticism. Uh, and now, obviously, it is uh, something that is extraordinarily popular and producing work of, of real interest. And I think the more that people turn their attention to Shakespeare, the more they see how rich he is in this. 
for many years, the only thing that got me weeding was a line from Shakespeare, which is, now is the spring and weeds are shallow rooted, suffer them now and they'll overgrow the garden. So even when I didn't want to, I would always think of that and go out and do the weeding, which is my least favorite job in the whole garden. Uh, and Shakespeare knew that because he, he does have first-hand personal knowledge of gardens. They are a thing of great interest to him. So I think he's a very rich source for uh, the modern tendency to read in eco-critical terms. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, another question for Mina Villan. While Shakespeare's plays were considered the best always in literature, though he wrote only 37, which feature makes his play unique? Uh, I, my answer to that would be that he underwrites, that he leaves things to the imagination. We are still discussing now why Hamlet delays. Shakespeare could perfectly well have told us why Hamlet delays. He chooses not to do so, and by doing that, he keeps us interested. Uh, and by the, the same token, there are other scenes in his plays that you, you are left wondering what is going on. So, for in, in Antony and Cleopatra, a messenger comes along and makes it clear to Antony that his wife is dead, and this apparently is a big surprise to him. Uh, and in Julius Caesar, similarly, Brutus explains to Cassius that his wife is dead, and then somebody tells him so, and apparently this is a big surprise to him as well. We are left wondering why, why do they pretend? Why, why are we not told? So it's because Shakespeare's plays never show us the whole picture, but we keep looking at them. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, another question this uh, is, what do you have to say about Shakespeare's obsession with uh, exotic things like the perfumes of Arabia in Macbeth and many other things? What is well, your take on it? There's a bit in Hamlet, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. I think Shakespeare lives at a time when that is constantly becoming more and more true. <laughs> Kind of hideous way we can perhaps sympathize with that because during the course of this year things have happened of which we had no experience which we could never have guessed if you said to me a year ago today that i would be have been sitting in my house for six months because of a global pandemic i'd just be totally stupid that couldn't happen uh, things are constantly happening in shakespeare's world that can't happen or haven't ever happened before and, and i think he's just astonished by them and fascinated by them. He, he just keeps drinking them in. He's not afraid of the new. I'm sorry to say it is a kind of besetting sin of the English that we often have been afraid of the new. Shakespeare's the exception to that, or what an exception to it. Uh, as far as he's concerned, bring it on. Perfumes of Arabia, new plants, new food. Oh yes, I'm there, I want it. Okay, ma'am, there is uh, one question from Shima Srivastava that how is the element of tragedy by Aristotle different from Shakespeare? Ah, well, Ben Jonson uh, made fun of Shakespeare because of this. Uh, so the Winter's Tale, one, the first half opens in Sicily, the second half opens in Bohemia, and we are casually informed, like as if it was no big deal, that the second part is taking place 16 years after the first, and Ben Jonson had a lot of fun with this. But Shakespeare actually does know perfectly well Telian unities. He does it in his, I think, first and last plays, Comedy of Errors and The, the Tempest. And he also has a, a, an idea about the Aristotelian notion of tragedy. He knows that there's supposed to be a, a great man with a hamartia, and he kind of does that. He sort of gestures at it, but it's never a single hamartia, and it's always complicated and nuanced. So it's there. I mean, obviously, Othello is jealous. Yep anyone can see that, but he's not just jealous, and that's, that doesn't do justice to the play. I think Shakespeare would have thought that the Aristotelian notion is slightly too simple, or perhaps he would have understood that what we have of Aristotle is basically lecture notes, and that, uh, that there was probably a greater subtlety behind them. Okay, thank you, ma'am. There is another question. Uh, what is your opinion of Shakespeare's usage of garden as an objective correlative in completely different ways in his different plays? Yes, I think that's a very interesting way of putting it. Uh, it is a kind of objective correlative. 
it, it adds atmosphere, but it, it also is an index to what people are thinking and feeling. It's also, it's typical of his daring stagecraft because you can bring a few props onto the stage to kind of suggest a garden. And certainly in the Henry VI plays, there must have been something that looked like a rose tree or possibly something, two things that looked like rose trees. But generally speaking, on the bare wooden boards of the stage, it's pushing it really to say, look, here's a garden. But Shakespeare likes to push you. Uh, he wants you to imagine a garden or a battlefield or sometimes the sea. Uh, it, it, he's not frightened of doing that. And I think it, it's one of his exotic locations. But yes, it is a way of uh, helping you to understand what people are thinking and feeling. Just as gardens do tell you something about the personality of the person who planted them. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am, for answering all the questions. Uh, we look forward to see you in the conference as well that will be held in the month of December. Uh, thank you for a very nice session. All the, uh, all the viewers have enjoyed it to the fullest. Thank you once again. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Have a very nice day. Thank you and you all. So that is all for today. Uh, we have already pasted uh, the feedback link for today. Uh, do not get panicked because feedback link will be pasted every after the end of every day and after the end of the last session of each day. So if you fill uh, today's feedback form, your presence will be marked. So thank you all for staying tuned with us. Tomorrow we will be meeting on 3 p.m. We have with us uh, a TSOL trainer from Lancaster University. So stay tuned with all of us. Thank you.